или липс Happy Birthday. Um, uh, so the, the thing is that uh, I think it's about 66 birthday, right? Which is very s small number. I mean, if you think about this, like Adam lived to 920 something, right? And uh, <laughs> and uh, the the smallest uh, exponent of uh, infinite Burnside group is 665. So it's you have some. Um, at anyway, so uh, so uh, Ilya actually is, is uh, in big uh, way responsible for me doing group theory. He came to Nebraska in '94, I think, and uh, basically said that the group theory is very easy. Yes, uh, so I started doing it. Um, so we have two papers together uh, uh, in Annals of Mathematics about then functions. And uh, the, the, the thing is, when he came to Nebraska, he said that, I mean, the question was how to produce group with arbitrary then function. Uh, and he said, okay, so you take the boon of construction, uh, remove the like, offending relations, and modify the, the machine after that. So, and that will work. Okay, so that's very easy. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it, <laughs> it turns out it to be... Uh, something more, more than that, uh, about two years. But uh, the, 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 the thing is that it, it's almost like if you take a chair, remove all the screws, and try to dance on it, so uh, try not to collapse. So that's, that's what it was about. So, but I knew, so that's, uh, 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 so we, uh, and finally it, it was done. There was another, so we have these two papers, but there is also, if you look at the references, there is also one more reference to our joint result. It's, uh, uh, in fact, if you look at the Gromov's paper about random groups, it says that uh, Rips and Sapir proved something, right? that you can embed the expander in a finitely presented aspherical group. So, uh, okay, so that, that's, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, there was no such paper, but Gromov said that uh, this is true, so it was referred to for 14 years, it was referred to as like either Sapir, I mean, Rips Sapir result or Gromov result, because, I mean, I didn't announce it, the Gromov announced uh, And it turned out to be true. Uh, <laughs> so I, it was published this year in, in uh, um, so, so Gromov has a quality which is very similar to Ilya uh, quality that uh, he, he's always right. So whatever he said, if it just looks outrageous at the beginning, then eventually, uh, it's right. So, by the way, there is a one conjecture of uh, Ilya Rips, which not very many people know, uh, that uh, when he was in Nebraska, we were uh, with Victor Gubov, he was also there, we were interested in Thompson group, and at some point we asked him, do you think that Thompson group is automatic? And he said, of course it is. It was in 94. So it was not even known at that time that the then function is quadratic. So now it is known that the function is quadratic, but the conjecture is still open. So, so it may be true because Ilya said that. I don't know why he said that, and I don't sure, I'm not sure that he still remembers why. But uh, he said that, and it m must be true. So it's one of the outstanding conjectures about Thompson group that is automatic. Anyway, so uh, uh, okay. So I'm going to talk about um, Tarski groups, Tarski uh, uh, numbers of groups. Uh, it's a uh, it's a basic uh, concept related to non-amenability. So if you have a group which is non-amenable, it was noticed. Uh, I mean, the first paper about non-amenable groups by von Neumann. Uh, there, is, there was one of the characterizations of non-amenable groups that uh, G contains uh, like m plus n subsets, disjoint subsets. Uh, and uh, translating elements such that G is equal to union of AI GI and it's also union of BI HI. It's a paradoxical decomposition. So every non-amenable group has paradoxical decomposition. The smallest sum M plus N is called the Tarski number of a group. 
Okay, so that's very easy definition. Okay, so the m plus m is a task in number of a group G. Okay, so that's a basic uh, thing. So, for example, it's uh, well known that because of the banach tarski paradox, in fact, Hausdorff paradox, not banach tarski so that free group has task in number four. It's, it's obvious that uh, every group has task in number at least four. And there is a result by uh, Deckard um, that the group has task in number four if and only if it contains a free group, free non abelian group. Okay, so uh, uh, then uh, it's just easy observations. Uh, okay, so th that's what we are studying. The question is what, what kind of numbers are task numbers of groups? Okay, so four is task number of a group, what are they? So the first observation, which is kind of obvious, is that if you have these translating elements and you multiply them by G and this by H, you still have translating elements because I mean G times G is equal to G. Okay, so it means that we can assume that G1 is equal to one and H1 is equal to. One. So this is, uh, this actually leads to kind of definition of a true task number. The true task number is task number minus two. It's less true rank of a group is not the number of generators, the number of generators minus one, all right? And uh, like free, free group, for example, the true, true rank is uh, number of generators minus one. So this is the first thing. The second thing is that uh, you can immediately say, okay, so if you have this thing, then the subgroup generated by G's uh, is also non amenable Because if you take uh, subgroup generated by G and you translate with these uh, pieces, uh, you still have uh, pieces, paradoxical decomposition of the subgroup generated by G. So it's non amenable And uh, moreover, the task number of that group must be at least the same, the same thing. Okay? So in particular, uh, what you can immediately deduce is that, for example, if you have a group and every say k generated subgroup is finite or amenable then the task number must be at least k plus two right because uh, k plus two and uh, so the question it, it was noted by azawa um, but the, for example uh, how to construct a group with arbitrary large task number you take golot shafarevi group you take a group constructed by golot in uh, 1964, right? In fact, maybe 1966, I think that's uh, the, the group where it is D, D plus one generated group. It's just one of the first application of gold shafarevi groups. You take D plus one generated group where every D generated group is nilpotent. In fact, finite nilpotent, right? And then the task number of that group is at least D plus three D, D plus three and uh, um, okay. Now, of course, the question is maybe it is infinite, so maybe it is non, maybe it's uh, maybe amenable. And the, there was a question like that uh, whether uh, there exists gold Shafarevich group which is amenable. In fact, this question was related to uh, uh, the question about hyperbolic three manifolds. It was noticed by um, um, Lubotsky in 1980 that if you take hyperbolic three manifold, then it is virtually gold Shafarevich. I mean, the fundamental group of it is virtually gold Shafarevich. It's very easy because all the characteristic is zero. And uh, if you take the, the finite index of group, then the, the number of generators grows linearly and the, the number of relators and, and so So eventually uh, you have this um, gold Shafarevich property. And, the, and then the, the, it was noticed that if um, uh, this groups don't uh, have this property tau, then the virtual non-trivial Betty numbers conjecture will be true. And there was a conjecture by Lubotsky that indeed all these groups have trivial uh, first, uh, 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 will, 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 do, will not have property tau. And that was disproved by Yershov. So Misha Yershov, uh, in fact, to, also in the paper together with Heiken, uh, they proved that every gold Shafarevich group is non-amenable. That was a big result. 
uh, in fact, there are Golgi Faraday groups with property T, and every Golgi Faraday group has an image which is, has property T, Not infinite image with property T. Anyway, so that's, that implies that there is a, a group with arbitrary large Tarski number. It doesn't say which numbers are Tarski numbers, but still, uh, there are such things. Okay, so group with arbitrary large Tarski numbers, um, and non-infinite, finite task number. Mark, uh, yeah? could you repeat again the, uh, the definition? I'm having trouble understanding the definition of task number. Is there a disjointness or a minimality condition? So here is a disjointness. Here is not. But it's equivalent. You can assume that it's disjoint. You can assume that this covers the whole G. And so in our paper, in appendix, we prove that it's all these conditions are equivalent. So you don't need to assume that. There's a subset. Just subsets. Subsets, yeah. The subsets, uh, for example, for free group, you have four sets, like all words starting with A, all words starting with A inverse, all words starting with B, B inverse. There are four sets, right? So they're disjoint, and uh, if you multiply the first two by A, right, well, on the left, it doesn't matter. Uh, or the second two by B, you get Not necessarily. Oh. So, so wh why couldn't you take all the A's to be the same and all the B's to be the same? They're disjoint. I mean, I'm sorry, the A's to be the same as the B's. Use the same. Use the same I'm sorry? Why? No, they're all disjoint, all together. Oh, they're all disjoint. All disjoint. Okay. So th these are all disjoint. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't demand these things to be disjoint, the, the translations. The translations may be dis not disjoint, but you can also demand that. It will be the same number. You can, you can demand that this will be disjoint and also G. Um, is equal to the un union. You can also assume. So. Okay. So anyway, so uh, what what uh, actually you can also construct using this gold Schaffer-Ish construction. You can construct a group, uh, easily definable group, such that uh, if you if you, if you if you go down, if you take the finite index subgroups. And for every n, you have a finite index subgroup where every n-generated subgroup of that is finite. So you have a group G, and for every n, there exists a finite index subgroup <coughs> at most finite in G, such that every n-generated subgroup of H is finite. And G is itself finitely generated. It's also, it's very easy to do using gold Schaffer groups. I, I don't have time to explain, but it's, it's very, really very easy. So this is, a, this is one of the beauty of, of gold Schaffer groups. First of all, it, it solved like 60, pro, 60 year problem in a half a page proof, the Burnside problem. It solved that the, the Hilbert uh, t class tower conjecture, also like half a page. And uh, it, it can do all, all these all this things very easily. In some sense, it's very similar to Capibolic groups because Capibolic groups have the uh, property that you c they have very many quotients. If you take Capibolic group, you, sli you can slightly modify it by, by, by killing some long, long complicated elements. Here, you can also take gold Schaffer group. You can, you can slightly modify it very little by killing like long commutators, for example. <coughs> It's, it's still gold Shafarevich and uh, okay, but anyway, so you can you can get that, and so what you what you can have, uh, uh, you can actually assume that G is a two group, so all exponents of every element is powers of two. What you can get is that you can have one group where the Tarski numbers of finite index subgroups are arbitrary large, right? So, for example, if you take T to be the Tarski number of group G. Then there exists finite index subgroup of G where the task number is bigger than T. Right? And it means that having task number T is not quasi isometry invariant. Right? Now remember that if T was equal to 4, that would solve a problem of Benson Farb that the existence of free subgroups. Is not quasi-isometric, but in, in fact, unfortunately, 
the task number, the only estimate of this task number is something like 10 to the power 10 to the power 8. So it's far from being 4, but still some, uh, some task number is not quasi isometry invariant. In fact, not invariant on the finite Did you say that somebody proved that uh, k equals 4 that's even on the Euclid existence? There was an announcement of that 10 years ago. No, but it's conjecture. It's still open conjecture. Um, existence of free sub-semi group is, is not quite as symmetry, no, but existence of free sub, uh, sub-group is still uh, open. Okay, so, um, so that's um, the first thing I wanted to say. And the second thing is, um, Okay, so there, there, there exists group with arbitrary large task number. In fact, the, the fact that G is a two group, and in fact it's residually two, residually finite two group, what you can get is that the, the, you can get the sequence of subgroups, of finite index subgroups, such that each of them has index two in the previous one. And so, uh, and what we prove in our paper, if the index is two, the task number can increase only by a factor of two at most. And so, for every n sufficiently large, there exists a task number which is between n and 2n. So you can have that. In fact, you can have a subgroup of finite index of G with a task number between n and 2n. So we still don't know what set of a task numbers is, but we know it's, it satisfies kind of Bertrand postulate uh, condition. So between n and 2n, there is always a task number. But we still don't know what kind of task numbers exist. And in fact, for, uh, for quite some time, there was no uh, examples of uh, any number greater than four, which is a task number. And the theorem that we proved is that, uh, so it is your show. Um, so we proved that five and six are task numbers. So seven is not known. Okay, so how to do that? So first of all, you can re reformulate this definition in a graph theoretic way. The reformulation is very easy also. You, you look at this uh, decomposition and you look at the Kelly graph with respect to G's and H's, right? So, okay, so let's assume that edges labeled by G are green and these are like blue, I don't know. Right? So what, what happens is that if you look at the Kelly graph and you look at the, um, the subsets A, I, B, I, what it says is that every element of the group has two incoming edges, one blue, one, whatever, one green, one blue, right? Two incoming edges. And every, edge, every, every element, if you just, uh, you just consider this, decomposition, every element has only one outgoing edge. So every element belongs to only one, at most one, A or B, right? So it has one outgoing edge, which corresponding to one of the G's or one of the H's, right? And every element belongs to this set and this set, so it has two incoming edges, right? So that means that, so the task number N plus N, means there exists um, green, blue, two graph, two subgraph. Of the Kelly graph, of the Kelly graph corresponding to these G's, H's. Right? So it means that there is a, there is a subgraph, so it, it, it contains all the, all the vertices, right? Because every vertex belongs to G, right? And this subgraph has two, uh, so every vertex has two incoming edges of different colors, and every, every, every vertex which belongs to A has one outgoing green, every vertex which belongs to B has one outgoing blue, okay? So now how to construct, and it's equivalent. 
It's equivalent thing, right? So how to construct such a graph? There exists uh, this well-known tool to construct such a sub subgraphs in an infinite graph. It's called the whole marriage theorem or marriage lemma. Okay, so what it says, so if you have a boys and girls and every boy likes some girls and you want to marry every boy to a girl whom he likes, the way to do it, I mean, the, the condition for which it is happening is that if you take like K boys, they like together at least K girls, right? So what it means is that, okay, so if you have our Kelly graph consists of boys and also girls, I mean, you don't distinguish in this marriage kind of theorem. Uh, uh, notice that since uh, one is one of the G's and one is also is one of the H's, then there are some, in this marriage, uh, there are some loops. So it means that some vertices are married to themselves. That, okay. So now what to do? So we have a bunch of vertices. What, what's the whole, whole statement says, whole, the statement of the, of the lemma says? If you have a bunch of vertices, the, the, the number of edges coming in, these vertices, the number of, the, the boundary of this set must be big enough, right? At least the, the boundary of the set must be at least the size of the set, that's what it is, right? So if you have a set, any finite set S, and we look at the edges labeled by this G's and H's, the, the in the Kelly graph, the number of, of, uh, of all uh, vertices which are connected to the set must be at least the size of the set because then we can just include the the loops here and we, we have this marriage condition okay so it, it, so what what it says is that this whole lemma marriage lemma say that this task number is is related to the to the uh, chigia constant of the graph so how the graph expands so we take a subset of of vertices and look at the boundary of this subset, all the vertices which connected, and we, we want this to be large. Okay? And in fact, you, you, can, you can use this thing so the, the connection be between task numbers and the uh, Chigia constant and also co growth of the graph, because the group is, uh, is non amenable, so that you can compute co growth, which is like less, than, like less than the maximum. So the there is an estimation of one of these things in terms of the others. There's a formula which estimate co-growth in terms of task number, task number in terms of co-growth, and so on. And for example, it was proved by Grigorchuk, Cesarini, uh, Schildberstein, and Delap that the task number of the free Burnside group of exponent 665 uh, is between 6 and 14 using this co-growth estimation. So you just look at the deep proof of Adjan's proof that this group is non-amenable. Using this proof, you estimate the co-growth Using co growth, you estimate the asking number. Okay. But still, we don't know what it is exactly. It's you know, only between 6 and 3. Okay. Now, if you want estimation of, of uh, uh, task number exactly, so we need to estimate the, the uh, Chigger constant exactly. And that uh, is a non trivial question. If you take some group, how to estimate the, the size of the boundary of a subset? And what you do is use some probabilistic methods. So let me explain you what it is. And, uh, I think there is no. Uh, well, I can still use some part of the board. Uh, the eraser. <laughs> it's okay. Ah, there is an eraser. Yeah, that's eraser. Okay. Okay, so it is. It turns out to be related. All this uh, discussions turned out to be related to the notion of cost of group. Or cost of group action. So if you have a group G, and suppose that it acts on a measure space. So X is a measure space. So the action is preserving measure. Okay, suppose that we have a group acting on the measure space. 
Okay, so then the X and the action is uh, say by Borel maps and so on. So now, so it's a nice action, measure preserving. So then, uh, okay, there, there are orbits. So this action has orbits, and then we, we try to kind of. Uh, Okay, so every orbit is a kind of copy. Suppose that the action is free or almost free. The, every orbit is kind of copy of G itself. And so we can embed Kelly graphs, Kelly graph of G in, in X by picking a vertex in every orbit and just taking the Kelly graph. So what we want now, we want to find some smaller subgraph of this. And uh, uh, it's called graphene. So graphene is actually inverse semigroup. So if you take some partial maps, we take partial maps from X to X, also measure preserving, so barrel maps. We take partial maps and we say that this is a graphene, it's a partial map. So it has domain, domain doesn't coincide with the whole X. It's a graphene. If phi i, each phi i preserves the orbits, so it means that if you take element from x from some orbit of this action, and we apply phi i, it's still in the same orbit. And second, if you can get from, uh, I mean, if two elements, x and y, are in the same orbit, you can get from x to y by applying several phi's. Okay, not we not one, but several. Okay, so it means that the, the closure of the orbits of phi is coincide with the orbits of, of G. Okay, so that's called the graphene. And then uh, the, the, the cost of graphene, the cost of graphene is the sum of uh, measures of the domains. Okay, so, so the game is we take action of our group on a space, on measure space X, okay? Then we start, we, we choose partial maps which produce the same orbits, and we, we want to choose them so that the domains are as small as possible, right? Small as possible. And the sum of these measures of the domains is the cost of, of the action. Hmm? The finite number, finite number. The finite number of phi's. So it, it is kind of, you, 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 you define some kind of inverse semigroup, the kind of the restriction of G on some, sign of, on some subset, which is in some sense sim similar to what Ilya did with actions on the tree. But anyway, so we define these things and we, we, we say that the cost of this graphene is this and that the cost of action is the minimal cost of graphene. Infimum. Of all cost of graphene, infinite full cost of graphene. Okay, and then the cost of a group is the maximum for all the minimum for all the cost of all actions. Okay, so that's a cost of group. And this is actually a very interesting concept, and for me it was uh, new and we uh, started doing this. But it, it is uh, it was, I think it was introduced by Gabriel. By who? By Le uh, sorry, by Levit, by Levit, yeah, and then used by Gabriel, by Lyons and others. But it's, I mean, this is very, very nice uh, thing. Um, it is related to L2 Betty numbers. So it, it is known that the cost minus one is bigger than the first L2 Betty number. And it is, it is not known if they're the same. So cost minus one may be equal to L2, L2 Betty number. Okay, so there are many nice properties. What, what is good for us here is that the result of lines is that if cost is, let's say, cost of group of G is, say, beta, then there exists what is called the uniform random forest in the Kelly graph of G. So what is uniform random forest? So, okay, so we take a, a Kelly graph of G, it's a collection of all edges, and uh, we, we, we view subsets of all these edges, so subgraphs, 
as some kind of topological structure as a sub subset of a subshift. So it's, it's, uh, we pick, so for every H we put either zero or one, right? So it is zero, one to the power of all the edges of the graph, right? So this is a big <laughs> set, but it's a compact set. It has a, a nice measure, okay? And we consider subsets of, Borel subsets of this. So uniform, span, uniform spanning forest is a subset of is a is a is a is a, is a, is a, is a, is a subset of it, with uh, such that almost all elements of the subset are forests. So it's kind of uh, um, a way to choose a subforest of a Kelly graph of the group. Subforest which includes all the vertices, spanning forest. So it's called uniform. Now, uh, so for every element of this subset, so for, for every element of, uh, of Y, which is a forest, we can define the degree of it. So degree of it, degree of a vertex is the expected degree of, uh, of this vertex in this, in this set. So for every element of, of here, we, we pick a vertex. Then we can define for every uh, element of Y, which is a subgraph, we can define the degree x, which is a Borel map, and we take the integral of this. It's expected degree of a map. So that's the degree. Now, we only consider sub, sub, subsets which are closed, which are stable under action of G. So this is a uniform spanning forest. It's also, the, it has an action of G. And in particular, if you, if you have the action of G, then every vertex has the same degree. So if it, it's, it, there's an induced action on the calligraph in due section of this thing, okay? Now, the statement is that if you have a cost beta, then there exists uniform spanning forest where degree of every vertex is bigger than two beta. That's a statement by Lyons, okay? I mean, the, the proof is non-trivial. It's very non-trivial statement. It's used percolation and, and so on. So it, it's a non-trivial statement. Okay, so it's, so far, it's not clear how it relates to task numbers, but let, let me explain now. Okay, so the degree of every vertex is two beta. Now, look at the finite subset. Yes, right? You want to estimate the boundary of the subset, right? Boundary of the subset. And suppose that our group G is generated by three elements, A, B, C. Right? Suppose that G is generated by three elements, and suppose that beta, that the cost of the group, is at least five halves, 2.5, okay? Of course, the question is, do such group exist? Yes, they do exist. It's approved by Ossian. In fact, you can construct torsion groups with this property. What's X? Hmm? What's X? Where X? 2.5. You, no, no. Cost is defined as the maximum for all actions. Okay, so there is, so if you take the maximum for all actions is greater than five halves, then there, the, the, then there exists uniform spanning forest with degree in this case degree equals five. Okay. Now this is a degree with respect to which Kelly graph? The Kelly graph for A, B, C. A inverse, B inverse, C inverse, right? No, notice that there are six of them, right? Correct? That means that if you, if you forget about those, right? We only consider for every vertex, if you, if you look at the definition of the uh, task numbers, we are, we are allowed to translate by G's and H's, but not by G's inverses and H's inverses. So if you only allow it to translate by A, B, C, then we still have degree two of every vertex, right? And it is the average degree. But if it is, since it is the average degree for all forests, it means that there exists one forest for which this degree is two. We don't know which forest we take from Y, which has degree two in positive direction for every vertex. 
But we know that there is one because the average is two. Okay, the average is two. So we have we 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 have at least degree two for uh, for uh, the positive edges, and it is for every vertex. That means that for every set S, the, we can marry it. I mean, the, the number of girls that these boys like is at least 2S. And that means that we can construct the 2-1 graph. And so it means that if you take the, the, the uh, as elements, as the translating elements as A, B, C, then we have this 2-1 graph. Okay, so now, now there is a, a, a nice thing. So, uh, okay, so now let's consider G's, which is a one A B, and H's, which is one A C. Okay, remember that in the definition, in the graph theoretic definition of Tarski numbers, we have we have colors. So every set, every piece has color blue or green. Okay, so it means that we have to color. G's in blue and H's in green, right? But we only know that for every vertex we have two edges coming in. But look, for every two elements A, B, C, right? One of them is in this set and one of this is in the other set. So we can color this arbitrary, right? So if you have, say, this is A, this is B, right? We say this is green, this is, I mean, this is blue, this is green, right? Because A is here and B is here, right? So we know that every vertex has two edges coming in, and we can color them so that one of these vertexes is blue and one of them is green. And it means that, okay, so, so what's the task number? It's one, two, three, four, five, six. So the, the task number is six for this group. So what, 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 what I just proved is that if Betty number, I'm sorry, if, if the Kelly, uh, sorry, is the cost of the group is at least five half, and such groups exist, and the group is torsion. Torsion means that the task number cannot be five. Task number is at least six. I, I explained it why, because the one generated subgroups are finite. Then the task number is six. Okay, so if G is torsion, three generated, and the cost greater than five half, and such groups exist. Then, task number of G is six. Okay, so that was the first example of a number, which is a task number and number greater than four. The second example was constructed by Gilly, uh, Galan. Uh, she noticed, I mean, she uh, uh, she noticed by that by result of uh, Andreas Tom. Uh, what you have is that if you you can assume that one of these elements has infinite order then not only there is a uniform spanning to forest with, with this degree, but also you can assume that this, so every element has an edge in this forest with probability one labeled by this element. Okay, so if, for example, if A is, is infinite order, then there exists uniform spanning forest with, such as this probability one, every vertex has incoming edge labeled by A. And that means that the task, the, the, you can just say one A, is one translating set and one A, say C, one B C is another translating set, and what you get is task number five. So if a group is torsion is not torsion, in fact one of the generators is infinite order, it has three generators, the the Betty number oh, sorry the, the cost is at least five half, then the task number is five. Hmm? Group is uh, is um, uh, yeah it, it should it, it yeah it should have more than four yes right so it's not free no free subgroups no free subgroups no free non right so that, that, that's that's what you can do you can you can construct such a group using the same construction as ocean construction you just keep one element infinite order and do the same thing for the normal subgroup generated by the other elements. Okay, so there exists a group with task number five. So, and the, uh, let me uh, finish with, so the question is, okay, so there are several questions. So the first question is, 
What are the other task numbers? For example, seven uh, or eight. Uh, we don't know. But uh, Gilly has a construction, and it is uh, one of this uh, kind of. Um, I mean, if I was Ilya uh, Rips, I would just say this is very easy to, to, to prove uh, that uh, this uh, group has task number arbitrary, uh, in whatever number you want. There is a very nice construction of a group uh, with, um, uh, which has task number, so if we take n greater than 4, greater than 4, there is a nice construction of a group which has task number at least n. And the conjecture is that this group has task number exactly n. Exactly n. Now, the problem is you, you have to estimate the trigger constant. But this problem, the, 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 the cost method will not work because the cost of this group is always equal to 1. The cost doesn't work in this case. So you have to, you have to, uh, you have to invent something else. But I, I am pretty sure that your group has exactly task number n, but I cannot say that because I, there is no proof. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, uh, do I have a minute or something? Okay, so uh, the second thing which I want to say is that um, some open uh, questions about this. Uh, you can ask um, how these task numbers behave under um, the groups already constructions. What happened to them? For example, I mentioned already, so if you have a group G, and suppose that it is, has a subgroup of finite index. You know the task number of G. What's the task number of H? What you prove in the paper is the task number of H minus 2 is less than task number of G minus 2 times the index. This is Schreier formula, right? This is Schreier formula. I mean, the Schreier formula is for the number of generators, right? That's why I told you that the, this is a true task number, right? The task number minus two. Like this, for the same reason for the tri in the trial formula. So what we don't know, so what we, what we do know is that the task number of the finite index group does depend on the index in general. What we don't know is how sharp is this thing? For Schreier formula, if you take a free group, we take finite index subgroup, we know the number of generators of the subgroup, right? It's exactly equality. But we don't know any example where we have equality. In fact, uh, uh, we don't know any example where, like, we have, uh, in fact, linear or even, like, polynomial dependence of this in terms of that. Usually, it's kind of logarithm, right? So, uh, we don't know what, uh, how sharp is this. So what we proved also is this. So if you have this, it so for example, suppose that it's normal subgroup, then uh, what happens for, ta for task number of the subgroup, it depends on the factor. So suppose that G over H, we take the, the, the G over H, and suppose that it's a billion. If it is a billion, then there, is a, there exists a universal formula for the task number of H in terms of task number of G, which does not depend on the index. And in fact, you can replace a billion by solvable. And in fact, you can replace it by any variety of groups. You take variety of group where the, all the groups are amenable and the free group is orderable. If the free group of this for, for, for abelian groups, right? So free abelian group is orderable, and uh, all abelian groups are amenable, or solvable groups is the same thing. So if you have a variety of groups where the, all the free subgroups, all, all the free groups are orderable from both sides, and uh, all the groups are amenable, then the task number of H is smaller than some function of task number of G, which doesn't depend on the index. Right? So for amenable groups, we have this, I mean, for amenable factor. What we also know is that if you forget about 
uh, finite index, but you take any normal subgroup, and suppose that H is amenable, then the task number of G is equal to task number of G of H. I mean, you can, you can, uh, you can find similar statements like that about like sister algebras and so on. So this is, this is one of the things which, which we can prove. But what we, what we don't know is what happens to the, to the direct products. So the only thing we know is that the, the task number of the direct product is smaller than, for example, the square of the minimal task number of G and H. But it may be smaller than the task number. It, it should be smaller than task number of G. Free products contains three subgroups. So it is task number four. But for direct products, we don't know what happens to this. OK? Uh, I mean, using this fact, we can take any group with arbitrary large task number and embed it into two generated group with arbitrary task, large task number by using extensions by a billion by cyclic groups. But that's basically um, what we know. We, we, we have some other statements about the, um, the task number of uh, like constructions of groups, but these are some the typical statements. And the, the final thing which I want to say is that uh, there is a later paper by uh, Gilly Galan where she actually described all task numbers of group actions. You can define a, a task number of a group action the same way as a task number of a group. Right? So you take a group acting on X, where X is arbitrary set. Right? So you can take X. X contains AI and BI, BJs, and we have translated elements from G such that X is equal to union AI, GI, and union of BJ, HJ. Then the task number is the sum of number of sum of A's, number of A's and sum of num and number of B's. That's the task number of the action. And what she proved is that for every number k greater than four, there exists a transitive faithful action of a free group with task number k. So every number greater than four is a task number of a group action. Or in fact, a free group action, faithful free group action. This is a non-trivial fact. It doesn't use cost to prove it. It's just straight, I mean, direct construction. So we construct, so what, what she did, she, she constructs, uh, like, so what is the action of a free group? Action of a free group corresponds to a subgroup of a free group. So you, can, you have to construct a subgroup of a free group, which is a, it means you have to construct a Stolen's, Stolen's graph of the free group, of the subgroup of a free group, which satisfies certain properties, which implies the task in number is k. And that's what she did. So it's kind of monster construction for the subgroup of a free group. Yeah, right action. Because all the Kelly graphs are right. Okay, so thank you for your attention.